Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, Beloved Siblings, But Why, Psychology, Economics, Ethics, All words that clickbait and give me the appearance of intelligence. We call this marketing. Pokemon as a whole is truly a marketing phenomenon unlike anything the world has ever seen. Magic the Gathering, well they try. Pokemon is often copied, but then again never truly rivaled. All that said, Pokemon has an estimated value of between 92 billion and 100 billion dollars. Digimon comes in here at 28th with 6.3 billion dollars. The main reason Monster Collector franchises are so successful in particular is because Pokemon invented selling roughly the same game with different assets in it. Cyberpunk comes out, it's referred to as Broken Glitch Hell. But with Pokemon, a far more successful franchise, the fans go, Actually, the glitches are good, and code is art, and doesn't really need to function. Every single other speculative market, from collectibles to stock to NFTs, the NFTs. But why does Pokemon seem to be immune to things that seem to destroy every other market, from fluctuations in popularity, bad business deals, whatever? Why does this have no effect on Pokemon? Why is there no effect? You see, Pokemon fans are special. When you insult Pokemon, they react worse than I do when someone in my comments tells me my parents are glad to be dead so they don't have to see me be a disappointment. Why is this happening? Here's a clue. As a person born in 1906, I was raised in what can only be referred to as the Pokemon generation. Me and my three best friends have matching Pokemon tattoos. Champion in every region. I cried when Team Rocket said, now that's our Pikachu. Apparently, at some point in my childhood, I internalized something. This fascination. Why? And why do so many of us have it still to this day? This is Sigmund Freud. Now, you don't want to really run this card in a psychoanalysis deck. Instead, we're going to want to run four copies of Jacques Lacan and get directly into symbolic castration as quickly as possible. You see, in conjunction with the same psychoanalysis ability Freud has, he also has the theory of desire, which gives him symbolic castration. Social conditioning is any learned behavior. Symbolic castration is the beginning of learned social thinking. Symbolic castration occurs when the child is first able to form the word no to their caretaker, or negate to blue players. Why do we even use language? To communicate unconscious thoughts to the world around us. Yu-Gi-Oh players will understand this. Symbolic castration is a sacrifice. Sacrifice of what? Caregiver. Mommy. What is mom? Mom is caretaker. Mom is the object of baby's desire in desire theory. Mommy is baby's entire world. If mom is there, baby cries. And if mommy goes away, baby also cries. What Khan is basically saying is the childhood isn't bliss, it's a state of constant anxiety. This is why Lacanians, like Sobbles, only believe that the true emotion is anxiety and then various lesser states of it. And again, mom is point of desire to baby, so mom is the cause of anxiety. Desire leads to anxiety. And the other thing is, like, Buddhism kind of believes this too, that desire and ignorance lie at the root of all suffering. And in Buddhism, the goal is to reduce want to reduce suffering. Now, we can't reduce want entirely, but we can reduce the ignorance of why we want it. So mom is pre-symbolic, pre-linguistic, pre-social enjoyment. Learning the word negate, I mean no, is symbolically castrating you from your mother. We learn to express an unconscious desire through language that is a social condition, a learned behavior, to tell mom no. Why do we do this? To conform to learned social behavior. Being a child is essentially torture. You are governed by the role of your caretaker. But when you tell her no, you're expressing the desire to respond to unconscious stimuli through learned behavior. The act of symbolic castration is the act of giving up the caretaker role. We do this to conform with society. There's bad social conditioning like racism, a learned behavior. There are also good social conditions like age of consent laws. <clears throat> Why does this happen? Not the grooming, the social conditioning. You want to see the grooming? Go watch my Brian Stars video. Why, during symbolic castration, do we move the object of desire, remember this is the theory of desire, from mom to society? We're pack animals, like reproduction mouse over here.
we can form to play a role in society. But doing this moves the point of anxiety from mom to the society and your ability to function under the rules in it. So in Pokemon, what are the rules? Well, to catch them all, of course. To be the very best, like no one ever was. To catch them is my real test. To train them is my cause. Now here's a funny thing about hypnosis. Hypnosis can't actually make you do something you do not want to do. That is a common misconception. What hypnosis actually does is it suggests to you what you want. Suggesting to your subconscious that you want what the commercial, the ad, the 30-minute episode is not making you do anything. It's suggesting you might want to do the thing that it's telling you it, you can do, which is win and to catch them all. But wait, we can't let them fucking do that. A good way to think of this is does art cause violence? Lacan says no. But it can suggest the idea of violence. If you already desire to be violent, it can inspire it. If you already want to be the best, if you want to get them all, you can. And like hypnosis, it's your decision. It just suggested it to your subconscious. Like this meme, like the language I'm using, the unconscious interprets through symbols. Different people respond better to different stimuli. Some people like stories, some people like visuals, some people like the game, some people like the card game. But what if we hit them with all of the stimuli? What would happen if we hit them with all of the stimuli? What sort of monster could we create? It was like collect all the Pokemon so that you have all the Pokemons. And then how they made that, well, they made that part of a show and part of a story where collecting Pokemons was the most important thing because if you collect the Pokemons, you can be a Pokemon mas master and then all this stuff and you're watching going, okay, well, what's the story of this show? And then you realize it's just like a gigantic like thing to brainwash kids into buying these junky things. And like, so we just kind of made that into a big story. And this, this, uh, they're talking about the animation, but the immersive nature of video games is even more powerful. To even play a video game, you need to accept a form of symbolic castration. You are agreeing to comply to the laws and rules of the game's code and the world, communicated to your subconscious through the symbols of the game, sound, imagery, whatever. And as soon as we join a video game, the video game's laws and code become our objects of desire. And objects of desire are sources of both anxiety and joy. And after the game, we recastrate ourselves and recomply to the laws of society. If you love Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering, Flesh and Blood, at some point your interaction with that art or the games or whatever moved your subconscious desire to what the game was suggesting to you. Real genius of Pokemon's marketing, however, is that their slogan can be applied to any product. See if you can sell a product, put Pikachu's face on it. Pikachu product sold, let's get it in Charizard. Which brings me to operant conditioning and the point I was making. If Pavlov trained a dog, Pokemon trained a generation. Which is, um, kind of ironic, considering we're supposed to be the trainers. Hmm... Operant conditioning is used to train specific behaviors through what can be called positive and negative reinforcement. Open a pack, get a good card, that is positive reinforcement. Playing Pokemon Go in the woods, getting stabbed, that is negative reinforcement, but not a reason to ever stop. This is B.F. Skinner, and we are going to talk about this old man's box. Skinner used to fill his box with mice. These boxes apply positive and negative reinforcement. But wait, submersive, loot boxes, packs. Now if we combine Lacan's theory of desire, combined with this psychopath's complete willingness to change people's mind with his boxes, Pokemon games, the cards, these are essentially Skinner boxes. Elden Ring, a critically acclaimed game, I would say is an ethical Skinner box. But it is not touching Pokemon numbers. And so, Pokemon accidentally on purpose created hundreds of Skinner boxes. Which brings us to artificial scarcity and economics. Next time on Trading Cards, Psychology, 
economics and ethics.